Hello, this is Dr. Christensen from the University of Texas at San Antonio. You're watching Teaching Learning Cast with Piri Herrera and Benjamin Stewart. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Ben, for that introduction. Uh, today, it's uh, another Saturday in which we join to talk a little bit about education, teaching, and learning. How are you doing, Ben? Excellent, Pity. Getting uh, ready for the fair. The fair is getting ready to kick up here. This is one of the biggest fairs in, in Mexico, so things are... Uh, we've got one more week of class before we we close down for two weeks to uh, to celebrate uh, the fair. People come from all over the world, and uh, we're kind of getting geared up for that. But uh, glad to be here today. This is our weekly broadcast where we uh, talk about different educational topics, usually within the context of the English language classroom, since uh, Bidi and I are within that uh, within that field uh, where we teach pre-service and in-service English language trainers in a BA program, and uh, have a great opportunity to really share some of our experiences and our ideas. And uh, we really encourage all of our uh, listening audience uh, to participate, get involved in the discussion, and there are various ways you can do that. One is to access the Facebook page. We have a Facebook page that is public that's called Teacher Learning Cast, where you can uh, post questions either during the live broadcast or throughout the week. We're constantly monitoring that uh, that site and uh, really want to reach out to everyone to really let us know what you think of what uh, we're discussing, leave suggestions, leave comments. And um, also, if you want to be part of the show, we're always looking for teachers to uh, to be uh, to be brought into the live hangout. Again, we meet every Saturday morning and um, we're always looking for uh, guests to be a part of the conversation. So uh, you can find me at my website at benjaminlstewart.wordpress.com, and you can visit uh, Pity's website at homers2000.wixsite.com forward slash Pity H A. That's P I R Y H A. Yes, yes. I, I, I kind of found that. Um, an easier way to reach us is just to Google Teacher Learning Cast with your name, Benjamin Stewart, or my name, P.D. Herrera. And it's uh, kind of a better way to reach us in, 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 in a simple mode. Because you can find in the same search, you are going to find our website, you're going to find the, the Facebook page for us, and there you can follow the programs. Uh, last time we met was uh, 15 days ago, after, because we, later we took a long weekend here in Aguascalientes. And uh, we discuss interesting things about deep learning and, and uh, kind of a, a very interesting topic about um, uh, how learning doesn't stop just at the content, right? And, and, and it goes quite beyond and it's a life learning thing. And we also discuss about uh, some very uh, overface, uh, o o like, like an cover view as, as a general thing, an introduction, let's call it that to planning based on objectives against uh, the activities in the classroom. And today, Benjamin, what do you have for today? Yeah, and so to really extend this idea of deeper learning, um, we I came across a, a really good article uh, from Anna Katsumi uh, that where she addresses the idea of critical thinking. And I wanted to share a few ideas this morning about really how we can bring in this idea of critical thinking in the English language cl uh, classroom. I think a lot of times when we think about uh, the English language classroom, I think it's very easy to get caught up into the maybe the course book where we typically kind of uh, go through uh, different concepts, maybe page by page. And, you know, course books are, are wonderful in the way they organize information and, and, and have nothing against uh, course books. But I think we can also think of maybe other opportunities what 
where we can extend beyond the, the course book and promote these, this idea of critical thinking. And so today I want to throw out some ideas and, uh, and see what you think, Pity, and our listening audience uh, about this idea of how we can incorporate or bring in critical thinking skills uh, with our English language learners, really regardless of the level and even regardless of the age. So this particular article, uh, Anna talks about this idea of critical thinking and one of the reasons why she thinks that critical thinking is important uh, is that she, she thinks that it really impacts interpersonal skills. She states that uh, by thinking critically, we see things from different angles. Students become more open-minded and empathetic. They, they become better communicators. They're more inclined to collaborate with their peers and receive and discuss their ideas. Thinking more about students as individuals, it is possible to say that critical thinking helps them to develop their creative side. So this idea of creativity comes into play where I think most of us kind of see, uh, if, especially thinking in terms of Bloom's taxonomy, this ultimate goal really of our students to be creative whatever that might look like how can we promote this idea of creativity in the english language classroom it also allows students um, to think more freely and just explore possibilities and one of my favorite uh, points that she mentions here is the idea that it makes students better decision makers i mean i think at the, at the heart of Critical thinking really, I think, is this idea of how can we reach out to students in a way that makes them better decision makers. You know, we always think that, uh, well, we don't always think, but I think sometimes it's easy to think that we need to make, as the teachers, all of the decisions in the classroom. But I think it's this idea of turning over to the students the role of making decisions, not only about their own learning, but their daily life in, in general, if they're thinking about in terms of, um, you know, getting into a field later on professionally, what kind of decisions they might need to be able to make, right? And so it's really this idea of how can critical thinking be leveraged in a way that makes students better decision makers. So she goes on and she lists out the six ways of applying critical thinking and uh, I want to expand very briefly on some of these through some other websites here, but very briefly, she mentions the first point of really promoting or beginning the, the first step of critical thinking is to really present a question, identify the question that needs to be addressed. And in a few minutes, I'll discuss the, an idea of uh, an essential question from Wiggins and McTighes. I know, Petey, we've discussed this many times, but I think that if you look at any classroom where critical thinking is to be promoted, you have to look at how questions are being used throughout the classroom discourse, not only from the teacher, but how questions are being posed by the students, either to the teacher or amongst themselves. The second point that she mentions is do research on it. She states that it's important that students use reliable sources. So now this idea of, especially in, in the day of the internet, where some sources are more reliable than others, we have now the infamous term fake news that uh, we hear about all the time. So now we have an idea, we have basically an opportunity for students to now start looking online and making decisions about, is this a reliable source is this a source that helps me maybe form an argument or to persuade someone uh, to do something? The third point she mentions here is a, applies information uh, we, about based on the research. So based on the initial question or the essential question, once they have found this information, how do they apply it or how do they apply it to some local context? And, and we've talked a little bit about the importance of setting context in the English language classroom. For me, this, this uh, third point about applying information really tunes into the idea of, okay, how does this work in this context? Because of course, it's going to differ depending on, on context. 
Number four, analyze it. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about that here, the difference between analyzing and synthesizing information. Uh, she just mentions analyzing, but I think I would also throw in synthesizing as well, um, because I think both of those processes kind of go hand in hand uh, when we think about uh, critical thinking. And finally, drawing conclusions. This might even this might even be predicting what might happen in the future. So students, whatever decisions or conclusions they may make, they may have to think in terms of, okay, well, how might this be different in a different context or what might happen next in the process? So this idea of kind of looking forward, I think really applies to this fifth point. And finally, uh, take action create steps, make decisions and that are applicable in the, uh, the initial question. I think for, uh, for our case in the English language cl classroom, we can start looking at different products that they produce, uh, whether they're brochures, their presentations, but some sort of authentic performance task where they're actually required to create something that kind of ties in all of the rest of these five points that are mentioned here. Um, so really briefly, the uh, critical thinking, I have have some other information to share, but Petey, I don't know what you think about this. Uh, if you have come across this either in your own teaching or from experiences from your, uh, your students who are teaching, pra or taking practicum courses, if critical thinking comes up, how it comes up, what challenges they face, or are you personal? Well, it's 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 really interesting because this is something I've come across uh, frequently in different from different angles. Uh, maybe they don't focus that much, uh, like with the term critical thinking. But when you when you look for information about reflecting about uh, teachers' development. Uh, when you look for information about, for example, the topic I'll address in, uh, later on about talking time and, and about different aspects in the classroom, uh, one of the main things that pops up is the, um, the importance of having the appropriate question the, or having the appropriate mood for students, setting the mood for students to be interested and, and, and willing to research and know about whatever you are going to present. The, the different aspects you mentioned, uh, they, I, I kind of uh, reminded also uh, about some of the aspects I will mention about when you talked in the classroom, the students, the, uh, when you talk to somebody in general, people just, the main thing is that they just need to know what is it that you have to say? Why is it relevant to me? And how do I do it? And, and it's kind of a, a, a short synthesis of this whole analysis of critical thinking at the end. If we are talking about something that students or, or the audience is, is going to develop or learn, uh, you can spread, spread these three questions into the six st stages that you have. And at the end, that's that's what it is. What uh, uh, Making the right questions and then um, uh, knowing why the questions are relevant, doing the research about it, and having an application of it. Yeah, I think this is a total shift, in my personal opinion, <clears throat> in the way that we plan our classes. Because if you look at these six steps that I talked about here, you know, I think one would easily uh, recognize that these six steps aren't necessarily going to be implemented in one class or not even two or three classes. We're talking about several classes, maybe a week, two weeks or more of classroom study that would be required in order to really achieve these six steps to really go after critical thinking in any meaningful and relevant way. So in, when we talk about the planning stages, um, I think looking at what that essential question is and that provides the basis of critical thought, that provides the basis of something that can be thought about and discussed, that can be communicated in some deep way, really, I think, is a total different uh, approach than just 
looking at it like today I'm going to talk about the present tense, tomorrow I'm going to talk about the past tense, and it, I think it really changes the way that uh, one plans. And I think if teachers want to take on this idea of critical thinking, it almost requires a different way of, you know, uh, looking at the planning stages instead of looking at maybe a typical your typical scope and sequence that you would find at the beginning of a course book and really look at it by either activity or problem or situation and just say, okay, I'm going to, we're going to spend one week on this either essential question or this problem or this situation, and then dive into all the linguistic aspects that are required in order for students to uh, to achieve that that purpose, right? That that goal. Um, but I think that's easy to say, hard to do. Yes, it's it's really complicated in the sense that uh, this is something frequent with teachers' information. Uh, I've been observing this last weeks, and I've seen very good classes and 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 very good skills from from the teachers that they know how to perform certain actions like uh, uh, leading students, organizing groups, or, or leading the activity. And, and, and in general, they are having good performances. But then when it comes to the idea of this critical thinking, like what happened in the classroom is that uh, they tend to have the idea that the classes, the teacher, the beginning of the class is having kind of a hook for students and then having the teacher provide some information in any way, but the teacher providing the information and then students doing something that they are asked to do with that information and uh, leaving a little bit aside the critical thinking. So in one way or another, this is what regularly happens. And when we come to the feedback discussion the, the, about the, the observation, uh, the regular answer when I when I lead them towards the awareness that your plan is based on me, the teacher, are going to show some information, students will do something with it later on, and that's the base of it. Uh, the regular answer is, well, that's the way I've been taught my whole life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I think that really boils down to, um, you know, a lot of the issues when we're looking at personal change, right? We we do what we're familiar with. Maybe we teach the way that we were taught. And yeah, I think that's that's a, a another topic, but I for another day. But I think that that in itself uh, speaks volumes, really, as far as really looking at our own biases because we all have them, and looking at how we can personally, you know, look at change, doing something uh, differently. You mentioned about hooking. Uh, the class, like at the beginning, typically teachers will set out to hook the audience. And I, I wanted to just kind of end my sh short segment here on critical thinking with some maybe more practical things to consider. And uh, this first uh, option here, uh, see, think, wonder. This is uh, one of three strategies uh, for encouraging inquiry-based learning that promotes critical thinking skills. And uh, they, they state here that the purpose of using basically a series of three questions is to provide this routine to encourage students to make observations about new topics, typically. They, they suggest that this is a good way to maybe even introduce a unit by beginning with the question, what do you see, followed by a question, what do you think about that, and a third question, what does it make you wonder. So by having these series of questions, I think we can easily see kind of alternatives for implementing these three questions. One being typically the teacher asking these questions to the students. Maybe another option in pairs, students asking each other these questions so that there are then exchanges. Students learn to have exchanges back and forth. And then also maybe a third option of maybe a small group uh, where maybe even many Socratic methods might be implemented in the class where kind of this question and answer, maybe you have even a questioner 
who is just his or her role is to just present questions to the small group to generate uh, ideas. But I, I like these series of three questions um, to begin a unit because I think it's a good way of kind of uh, forming this idea of reflection uh, with the English language learner and have them become more reflective learners. But I also think, and they don't mention it here on this website, but I think that these same questions can also be used maybe at the end of the learning sequence, let's say that students are presenting products or some sort of final presentation, they can pose these same questions maybe to look further into what uh, other possibilities might be uh, that relate to, to the topic. So I, I, I think in research we do this all the time where we present findings and then we make suggestions of further research or what are the implications of this going forward. So I think that we can kind of take those same concepts and again, depending on the level of the student, right? Uh, but try to try to promote these types of thinking skills. You know, I, I often hear other educators tell me personally, you know, that, you know, a lot of these ideas that we are promoting with critical thinking are too ambitious that, that, you know, if we're looking at a student that is at a lower level or maybe at, at a certain age, that they're not going to be able to, you know, or we're not going to be able to incorporate this type of thinking in the classroom. And to that, I would say that I think that we have an obligation as educators to, to pursue these and really make it our job to, to consider the, the context and the profiles of our students, but to promote these ideas of critical thinking because in real life they do this all the time from from young kids they're constantly thinking uh, critically i think it's our job to recognize how we can tr bring that into uh, the english language classroom where in formal education we also have uh, certain course objectives that we also need to meet Yes, and if you allow me to add, I would add to those three questions one more, which may be related to the what you think about it, but it would be like, what do you know about it? And, and meaning, what have you heard? What do you actually know about it? Uh, what do you, how, how do you associate this with, uh, with something, with your prior knowledge? Thinking from the approach of uh, activation, access, and analysis, like activating whatever they may know or associate with, and I think these questions are good leading questions to start uh, uh, making students really have inquiries about whatever the topic is. The, the other question would be, how do I make these questions so interesting for, for them so that they are totally engaged? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that uh, trying to begin to learn how to scaffold prior knowledge and future knowledge is about asking the right questions. And, uh, you know, these, these questions that we're posing here, I think just kind of uh, just really begin the discussion, right? But I think it's finding those right questions. You're absolutely right, Petey. And really we need to find ways to uh, ask those questions or bring in the questions uh, into the classroom. I know in the past that when I have uh, taught uh, thesis seminar, which is a research uh, course where students do do uh, do primary research. That one of the thing, one of the topics that I find really interesting is just how we ask questions in class. What by by recording ourselves, for example, we can easily find out what type of questions we typically ask in class. The sequence of questions, which I have uh, a great interest in, like how do we order, organize our questions in real time, you know, without really maybe even planning or thinking about it beforehand, how do we, how do we present questions to the students? How do questions really become part of our, our classroom discourse uh, in a way that helps students? And, um, you know, that's, uh, that's something that uh, I think is really worth re researching and because it's not something that I think most of us really think about, I, I know for myself, I, I, I don't really pay attention to the questions that I ask. And the only way that I'm going to know 
what kind of questions is just just to rec record myself and go back and analyze uh, you know what I what I did but that's basically I, I want to kind of sum it up there um, there's some other things here there's some good books that if you're interested in uh, looking at how to promote critical thinking skills in the classroom uh, here's a few books I mentioned uh, the central questions by Wiggins and McTighe so essential questions this is an excellent book uh, for how to promote critical thinking skills through the use of good questions. This book, uh, the Faulkner, I, I would recommend uh, as well. Okay, so uh, I think I'll stop there, PD, for this first segment. But uh, this is something that uh, I'm sure we're going to be talking more about as we we get into this uh, in different ways. How we can kind of tackle critical thinking from different perspectives. Yes, I, I just want to remind our audience that they can get in contact with us. They can uh, write, uh, state their opinions in any means. Uh, we have our, our fan page in Facebook, which is uh, Teacher Learning Cast. You just look for it like that in Facebook and you'll get to it. Uh, you can also get to Benjamin's website, which is benjaminlstewart.wordpress.com. And you can get to my website, which is homers2000.weeksite.com dot com slash pdha and uh if you google teacher learning cast with benjamin's name teacher learning cast benjamin stewart or teacher learning cast pd herrera you can find all of the ways you can get to us oh there you go we have on the screen we have the the facebook fan page and we we have the seven different uh programs we have had so far with very interesting topics which are already uh, yes yeah, I just wanted to say briefly that uh, this morning I posted a few questions uh, uh, regarding critical thinking and challenges that you face, any su su successes that you have had. Um, so we encourage you to let us know. It, it doesn't matter if it's after the broadcast. Uh, we can always bring in uh, comments, uh, and we really want to bring in your feedback in the show itself as much as possible. So, again, feel free to... You know, let us know, you know, what your experiences are. Uh, that's what this is really all about. It's not about us stating how things should be and that the way we think or our opinions are any better than any others. Uh, no, it's actually the opposite. We really are just trying to present ideas uh, to begin a discussion. And so we really encourage you to, um, to not only feel free to share your ideas, but whether you're an English language learner or a native speaker, that you have the confidence really to, to share your ideas uh, and to, to get involved in the discussion. So I just wanted to share that with you. I know uh, our next segment, uh, Pity, you have uh, want to talk about teacher talking time. And I think this is something that also relates to uh, critical thinking because I think it's really hard for our students to think critically when we are talking all the time you know, it's i don't think it works that way so um take it away right uh in fact that's a th i think that's a, a good way to introduce this topic because it's like getting into uh, a specific example about about critical thinking in the classroom from the teacher and from students uh it's it's about i was associating while you were uh, uh talking about the critical thinking aspect, I was associating it with um, how simple actions like talking in the classroom reflect our approach towards the classroom and how hard it is to implement this critical thinking uh, when our minimal actions are focused towards other kind of teaching, right? Towards giving information, providing information, and the question would be, well, what's the difference with having a book in front of you if uh, the only difference would be audio versus uh, versus written text, right? Maybe if that's the extreme case, right? But yeah, talking time, teachers' talking time is something I, I deal with uh, frequently as, uh, yes, as a reflection of what students, uh, maybe it's what they believe, what they've been taught before, or as somebody told me yesterday, that's the way they teach me in here, in this BA. <laughs> uh, 
And that's exactly um, something to really to really wonder about this critical thinking, right? And how how is that way? Well, talking all the time, having lectures and having expositions from the teacher in which the teacher provides information to students. And uh, well, the first thing is to make a, a bit of a difference between teacher's talk and teacher's talking time in the classroom, because uh, there are a lot of information. I was looking for information about this uh, just to see if I, I could find anything uh, like more intriguing and, and, and kind of interesting articles for, for sharing with you. And, and mostly all of them talk about the same things, but yeah, there's a, a, quite a difference between teacher's talk which is uh, the kind of language the teacher uses and the register, the characteristics, the, um, uh, if the style of speaking from the teacher, which is mostly teacher's talk, right? And, and, and it's a whole different, uh, uh, it's related, but it's a whole different issue to address because, because uh, it, it has to be related to, ideally it will be related to the objectives of the class and if you want to look at the perspective from uh, Bloom's taxonomy, the degree of of um, of learning that you want to to impress uh, to transmit to students. On the other side, we have teachers' talking time, which is pretty much the amount of talking during the class. And uh, and here is where I where I where I want to stress a little bit a couple of general ideas because it's also a deep topic, and, and it can be analyzed like step by step. Uh, and I go back to what I just mentioned a while ago during, during uh, the critical thinking situation. The audience is pretty much interested in what is it that you have to say? Why is it relevant to me? And how do I do it? And sometimes teachers uh, tend to go through these aspects in a very uh, rounded way, like going through different paths and taking learners through a lot of explanations and informations. I've come to see practitioners that they actually prepare two or three ways of explaining something. Now, that's that's a good thing to be prepared for an alternative. But the, the idea for the preparation is that they are almost sure the first one is not going to work. So it's kind of interesting to see when when you ask them, okay, so if you kind of sense that it would be difficult and you have an easier way to do it, why did you go through the first way you plan anyway, knowing that it may be a little bit more challenging? And, um, and that exactly is one of the, the, the small things that happens when, when, when teachers take over the time. Explanations, instructions, and all of this, uh, the teaching itself, the message itself may be, uh, lost in the way, maybe confusing students because, yes, because of the level of English, yes, because of the topic, but uh, sometimes mostly because of the talking itself, all right? Uh, Jeremy Harmer uh, talks about uh, maximizing students' talking time in the classroom with the idea of, of uh, diminishing teachers' uh, center classes and raising student-centered approaches, right, in the classroom. Uh, there's another guy, right, uh, that uh, they talk about, even they mentioned percentages, diminishing the percentage from teacher's talking time to 25% and having the students 75%, uh, doing 75% of the talk. But I've, I came across a very interesting uh, dissertation for a master's degree in China from uh, Xi'an Jian. Um, and one of the aspects, I think I, I, I read many things that I'm familiar with, and I came across these ideas from Harmer also uh, in, in, the, in this dissertation. But there was one phrase, and I think that, uh, that, that makes a very clear point. Yes, we agree with all the experts about the diminishing the talking time, raising the students' talking time, having more practice, and, and, and we can go deeply into different arguments. But he mentions that, the, the, the decreasing of the amount of teacher stock should not be blindly done. I mean, it's not just about, I'm not going to talk, I'm going to raise student stock. And this is what got to me. I, I think this phrase uh, is it's exactly what, uh, what, 
what links this as an example of critical thinking. Why would you diminish your talking time? Because you are raising a student's talking time. How? Through questionings, through making them interested on the topic, but how are you going to make them interested on the topic? Are you going to ask questions that they may not know? Now, if it is a new topic, for sure, there will be a lot of things that they will not know. So are the questions just an opening to your talking time again? I'm going to ask a question that they are not going to answer so I can explain. So that the, the smart thing in here is, uh, what do I do instead of me talking? And, and one of the hardest things is exactly that, to come with ideas for smartly talking when it, it, it precisely when presenting something, when you have some new information. And, um, and that's where the struggle comes with the students. And some I, I've come with, with practitioners, and I've come to face some of them that are actually convinced that Presentations should be something that the teacher has to master 100%, and it's the teacher's time to be there presenting. And there's no other source of information but whatever the teacher knows and tells the students. What do you think about that? Uh, you're mute. Oops, sorry. Yep. Um, I keep thinking about uh, one of our prior episodes with Ken Bauer on the flipped classroom, where we talked about really kind of looking at certain, if you want to call them lecture types of court classes or presentational type of classes where the teacher typically prepares to uh, dictate certain topics to the students that those types of events actually become recordings and maybe even uploaded in, let's say, Facebook, for example, I'm sorry, or YouTube, where the videos are made available to the students. And the expectation is that they go to those videos outside of class or maybe before class so that when they come in face to face, they're able to do some more dynamic type of work or activity. And for me, this screams critical thinking. It goes back to this idea of, okay, you know, we as human beings, we need to think about things and then we articulate or communicate about what we think. So if, if we don't think about the thinking first and we're just worried about the communication without the thinking, it's, I think it's just a, a fool's errand. I think it's, it's an idea that I think we're just missing missing the point. And, and I think as English language teachers, again, we are focused on language, of course. We're, we're trying to promote the learning of additional language with our students, but they're also thinking human beings. So I think we need to think about the thinking first in the planning, whether it's through essential questions, through problem-based learning, project-based learning. Um, there are many different ways to look at it, but to kind of look at what we do on a daily basis with language in the grander scheme of things of what is that overarching goal, that idea, that critical thinking, uh, if it's solving a problem, I mean, that would, that would be the easiest example. Like, let's look at how we can work together as a group and with our students to solve a particular real life problem. And then break down our, our activities on a daily basis and our language of, uh, objectives into what can we do on a daily basis to enable them to reach that next step and we, and we continue that process until they are able to complete that final performance task or solve that particular problem or at least learn more about a particular problem, okay? So maybe they don't solve the whole problem, but they can you know, learn certainly more about that, that problem. It's really about what Wiggins and McTighe refers to as these understandings, okay? And it's not the understandings typically from the Bloom's taxonomy, but it's more deeper than that. It's more uh, these essential uh, questions that we pose for deeper understandings so that they can learn to apply things, they can explain, they can have empathy, they have perspective, they have self-knowledge. Uh, Wiggins and McTighe calls, uh, refers to these as elements of understandings or facets of understandings. But it's, it's really about 
you know, looking at the different performance verbs that are available in any English or any learning context and finding out, okay, how today we're going to interpret these things, these certain things. Okay, today we're going to apply these certain things and really not looking at it from a behavioral objective standpoint, because I don't mean to say that, you know, in our objectives, we should have all these uh, performance objectives listed out. I think it's more complex than that. I think it's more emergent, but I think we need to recognize, okay, today we need to focus a little bit more on self-knowledge, on, 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 on autonomous learning. Tomorrow we might focus on the application, right? And so that we kind of look at learning more from a historical kind of a, a, a series standpoint over time, looking at how we can look in, and exhaust the different uh, ways of thinking uh, over time. And again, I think it really boils down to how, how we plan and, and looking at, I've yet to really, I've seen a lot of good course books, but I think there are uh, things that we can go beyond the course book to really bring in some uh, added benefit to the educative experience. Yes, uh, I think it, it, it all goes along. That's why I, I was saying that that um, this is kind of a, a very specific example of ex actions that look simple in the classroom but make a wide difference. Uh, the talking time in the classroom, the, my purpose of this segment, more than getting into the specifics and ideas on how to reduce them and all that, it's pretty much to, to post the question there, I mean, the, the situation. To, to, to help our viewers reflect on what's happening in your classroom. And, and this is the view that I see very frequently in, in language classrooms here in Aguascalientes at least, which is a high rate of teachers talking time, which doesn't mean like 90% of the class or percentages or whatever you want to mention. It means more time of teacher speaking than students analyzing or really working or applying or asking questions or participating in the classroom. So whatever it is, is more talking than these actions. And on the other side, the counterpart is that the teacher speaks while students need to be paying attention and grasping whatever they can from the talk. Uh, and this is pretty much the general view. Just two actions in most of the part of the classroom. One person with the responsibility of putting out through words everything that, that the teacher prepare or thinks is the essential part from the teacher's perspective, from his own perspective. And then on the other side, somebody uh, trying to focus attention, and get as much information as they can. Pretty much that's the, that's the picture. Now, the questions would be, is this really working? Is this effective? How is this, uh, uh, what kind of learning is this approach uh, promoting in students? I mean, there are different questions that rise when you see it from this point of view. Now, having this picture, teacher talking and everybody else just listening and, and grasping information and trying to focus attention and the younger there are, the harder it is. Uh, now, what is the alternative? What can I do? And, and, and that's something you have to reflect. What do I, what do I know as an alternative? Now, if, if we don't know what's the alternative to that, let's look through. Let's research into that. Let's have, Let's talk to somebody. How do you do this? How do you do that? And I'm going to jump uh, stride and to keep on with the line and the topic. I'm going to jump into the experience of the week, uh, which is totally related as one of the examples about uh, what can be done as an alternative. The experience of the week that I brought today, it's pretty much um, uh, what has been happening in my classes with the practitioners in teaching workshop, which is teaching amongst themselves simulated classes, but also is happening in teaching assistantship, which is having short intervention interventions in real classrooms. And um, what is happening there is that students are 
are, are noticing the importance of material. Material as the alternative for this approach of the teacher speaking and the students just paying attention. And we have come to a point in which we, we could analyze that if you're planning and in, in, during your planning, you prepare your material in such a way that the material is the class itself, that everything is there one way or another through examples, through short notes, through uh, images, through challenges for students. Uh, you can lead the classroom with less talking and more participation from the students in different ways. And I go back to uh, the questions for critical thinking you had, which I immediately related to questions for maintaining attention in, the, attention in the classroom. What can you ask students if you're only speaking? But if you have some material around which they can touch, see, or, or, uh, or, or that create in some way, there are a lot of possibilities. You can ask them about what they see in there what they know about what they see, how they relate what they see to the topic, and, and, and tons and tons of information can gather, which make uh, learning a little bit more meaningful, which helps the question that I made about why is this relevant to me? If you make that connection, material is helping the class not only in the topic, but in the context itself, in the relevance for students, in raising interest and diminishing the talking time as and, and, and I don't know if I'm making the point that as to this point, when you see it from their, this perspective, teacher's talking time is just to send them on something deeper going on inside the teacher. And making this change of not talking that much and trying to make a class in which there's a balance between my talking and the students talking, but not only that, between the students talking and the students doing and we analyzing and, we, and students asking questions and all of this balance changes uh, the perspective of teaching. And yes, as the experience of the week uh, leading into that, this uh, the preparation of material with the intention of the material is the class itself. And I'm just going to be there to lead or help whenever needed to maybe start up and tell you where's the beginning and, there's the, and where's the end of what I, whatever I prepare for you today, but then you explore. Examples, notes, uh, drawings, images, the board, or whatever you brought today. I think uh, your point about purpose uh, is spot on. And, and really, you know, of course, as a teacher, we need to have a purpose and, and, and recognize it. But more importantly, the students, need to recognize it, whether it's uh, been explicitly communicated by the teacher to the students or whether it's so obvious what the purpose is, right? They, there's buy-in, right? That they, they see they're motivated by the purpose of doing what it is. They recognize how it's relevant and so on. I think that point is so important. And again, I think it's easy to, to you know, say, but I think it's something that we need to reflect on every class because, again, some subjects are going to be more challenging than others for certain students. And, you know, there's a lot of situational, uh, there's a lot of context here involved. And when looking at how we uh, present the purpose and, and really make things as relevant and meaningful as possible. But I, I keep thinking of, and I say this to students all of the time, that what we do as teachers is not important. It's what the students are doing. And I think a lot of times we, as teachers, we think, oh, our role is so important and it's all about us, but really it's not. It's not about us. It's what can we do? How can we create the experience to give students opportunities to learn from those experiences or to take and be involved in those experiences where really our job is to create the situation right and create the opportunities and then get out of the way basically get out of the way and show and try to find ways to move students from being dependent which certain times they're all going to be dependent in certain cases to independent onto interdependent so that they are interdependent in the sense that they are now able to care and help others achieve certain goals and, and objectives 
So it's not about them, that they see their role more as a, as a link or connection to a, a bigger, greater thing, right? So um, I think that's very important uh, that we first are able to recognize our role in that transition for our students. And also, uh, secondly, that we're able to recognize uh, those different levels of dependency, uh, independent and interdependencies right. that, uh, that, and recognize that, that, you know, certain topics, some students are going to be at different levels. Some are going to be at the interdependent level. Some are going to be a dependent level. I mean, it's very complex, but I think if we're just in tune to that reality, uh, right. that I think it really changes the way that we approach our classes. Um, I would like to take the last few minutes here to share an experience that I think I, I can tie in a, a little bit to our discussions today in critical thinking and teacher talking time. As I am typically teaching students uh, in academic writing, I have a composition course, a fourth semester composition course, uh, where students are currently trying to, or they are developing a, an academic uh, essay. It's an argumentative essay. And with all of my students, I do this also with my first semester, second semester uh, propedeutic uh, students as well, who are also taking a writing class. But I ask them to really look at what I refer to as a problem statement, which is this prompt here that I'm sharing with you now. At the very top, it reads, um, it begins, I wish to learn more about. So I have a, each student write out the topic that they are wanting to write about, that they want to learn more about. So they all begin with the prompt, I wish to learn more about, and then a topic. And then they all continue the same way with, because I want to find out. And then they choose one, typically one key question word. Now I refer to this as the indirect question where they now look more specifically about the topic in terms of what it is that they want to write about. They continue on with in order to, and then they provide some significance. And this is really addresses your point, PD, about the purpose, right? So what's the purpose of writing this essay? The purpose of writing this essay is not to get a grade, although that is, you know, what many students tend to think of it as, as just a, an assignment. But more importantly, the idea here, especially with academic writing, is to recognize that there is a, should be a significance, right? And who the audience is, to whom are you writing this essay, who's going to be the reader the, and their background, what's the relationship between them as the writer and, and the, the, the audience, the reader. And through that conversation or thought process, the idea is that they can come up with a, a significance. Uh, I'll share with you a, an example of this problem statement that was modified from a, an example of a, of a student this semester. It begins, I wish to learn more about authentic materials. So the topic, generally speaking, is authentic materials. Okay. Then the indirect question begins, because I want to find out how teachers can adapt newspaper articles in a way to support better reading comprehension skills. So the idea is to take the topic that's general, authentic materials, then form an indirect question to find out how teachers can adapt to newspaper articles. Newspaper articles being now one particular example of authentic materials because the topic, of course, of authentic materials is very broad and et cetera. So the idea is to break it down to a very specific, doable, writable, you know, topic that they can develop, in this case, a five paragraph essay, and also link it, in this case, to a linguistic aspect of reading comprehension. And then the significance, being able to address this problem of students who don't like to read. You know, that's a, a real life problem that uh, I think most of us face. Students typically uh, do not like to read, so we want to try to address this problem in, in through the use of authentic materials. Now, the way that I propose this, this one sentence, uh, we spent several days, and, and which is very typical. This is a, this is not a one sentence, sit down one in 15 minutes, crank out uh, this, this sentence. 
the, the, the creation of this sentence requires many, I'll say several hours of reading articles. So students need to go and read uh, primary, typically primary research articles to really go in and find the information. Uh, most of this is done outside of class. Um, it involves facilitating and helping students find articles that relate to these topics, finding arguments. Uh, we, I haven't mentioned this, but since this is an argumentative essay, they have to also form an initial argument, counter argument, and a rebuttal. So it's talking about what a claim is and how to bring in those three arguments within the context of this problem. So this problem statement. So here is where, you know, uh, in my case with these particular students is I present the prompt and I guide them to find articles. We have, we're, we're lucky enough at the university to have great databases to find articles. So students really have a vast amount of resources that they can find these articles. But, so, but it's, it's my role is to really help facilitate them to find the articles uh, if they have questions, to use maybe certain search terms if they're not able to find certain articles, but really to kind of teach on demand, right? It's kind of like, you know, some students will ask more questions than others. Some will need more assistance than others. And it's really just trying to create that uh, atmosphere and, and situation where they can share this information and I can get out of the way and then teach as needed. That is kind of jump in and, and uh, you know, help them as, uh, as possible. Now, I will say that, you know, sometimes there are cases where we have to kind of anticipate certain problems where, or situations where maybe students feel like, oh, okay, I have all this freedom that, you know, I can, you know, do whatever. And, you know, there is a certain degree of, uh, intervention that needs to happen so that students are on task, right? So students aren't either wasting time or maybe going a direction that isn't intended based on the objectives of the, of the assignment or of the performance task. And, um, but I think it's, yeah, it's uh, something that we need to kind of think about, reflect on and learn. And as I'm constantly learning, trying to say, okay, how much is too much? How much is not enough? when do I intervene, and so on. And, and uh, this one example, this experience that I'm sharing with you today, um, looks totally different on by class, right? Uh, even if it's the same course, it's very, it looks very different, you know, reaching this one sentence uh, result will be very different based on the, uh, the learner, uh, you know, there are so many, many variables, right, that, that really go behind this, just this one simple task of creating one sentence uh, that includes these, these three aspects. But I think that the idea here is to, uh, in my case, present the purpose. Why do they have to do this? Well, this actually becomes the whole basis of their whole essay, right? I mean, this is, you know, if they can't get the, the problem statement uh, close, everything else becomes even more of a challenge for them. And so my job, I feel, as the, the educator or the facilitator is to try to show them the purpose of doing this and, and the reasoning and that by writing later on um, their essay, they can see how doing this uh, problem statement at the beginning is so important. Oh, yeah, I, I see I see very pretty good example about critical thinking here at a kind of a macro level, like a research thing in which they're gonna go and explore and have a lot of uh, knowledge and information and skills to be developed somehow. And, uh, and, and, and I take it, I, I, I was trying to make a connection between that and, and simple things in the classroom, in, in the language classroom, in the foreign language classroom, like, uh, but it would work the same. Having the students to focus the class, focus the class for students on the function of the language feature we are going to use, and looking for the right way for them to get interested. On I would like to know how to achieve this in communication. Like 
this kind of function. I would like to know how to be able to uh, conclude in a proper way an email, let's say. Uh, something, something uh, that would be a micro level in, in, in that sense. But it's pretty much, uh, it, it, it's a good approach what, what you showed us because you can kind of readapt it and, and make students. Now, the, the interesting question in here, uh, which is going to give us for more and more and more, but I, I think we are just on, on the top of time. It's how do I present this? Which is the format that I present this uh, um, motivational, purposeful questions or statements to be created? But which is the way that I present it that the students get so into it? Is it am I only going to ask them to uh, write the sentence or write the question or ask them a question directly? Am I going to bring uh, a proper material or something that it's going to motivate them? And I think that's another kind of topic in, in the delivery way for this beginning, for this fundamental aspect of, I think, any class, which is raising the right question again. Going back to previous topics, right? <laughs> yes. uh, uh, yeah, very interesting in that sense. Uh, I think we, we are on top of time. Yeah, I just want to make a final comment, kind of uh, to, as a as a closing statement, yeah. to really encourage teachers because we've talked a lot today about kind of this idea of inquiry based learning or kind of a research based learning type of approach to uh, critical thinking, and I really encourage all teachers to consider inquiry based at all levels because I think even just having you know students interview uh, other people uh, even come up with just the act of coming up with maybe a simple questionnaire it can be just a very very simple uh, uh, you know instrument that they use then later to interview someone else just the combination of creating these instruments and and getting students to ask and find information and report it really it's all about finding information kind of analyzing what it means and then reporting it but it can be done at a very simple level. It doesn't have to be a research-paced uh, uh, approach necessarily. It can be even with kids interviewing, you know, favorite colors with someone or, you know, different aspects of, of language that are very, very simple, but it's all within this context of inquiry-based or kind of a research-based approach to, to education, right? And, and there's been a lot of research done on this in, in all levels, not just English language learning, but in all uh, subjects of this idea of bringing in inquiry-based learning. So just want to throw that out there. Again, we, we do want to hear from you. If, if what we're saying is crazy and, and off base, let us know. We're all, uh, we, you know, we're, it, it's all good for us. Uh, all feedback is good. And um, uh, we don't take anything personally. We take everything seriously, though. So let us know. Let us know what you think. Let us know what challenges you face with trying to bring in and incorporate critical thinking uh, into your English language learning classroom. Also about teaching talk, talking time, how you manage it, how you feel about it, and what your perspectives are. You can leave your comments into uh, in our Facebook page under Teacher Learning Cast. You can leave comments there. Um, and uh, you can also reach out to us directly uh, if you wish. But we do really appreciate your, uh, your listening and watching our, our broadcast and give us suggestions if there are some topics that you would like us to address in the future. We're all ears, and we certainly encourage those, those comments as well. Yes, thank you very much, guys. We are live every Saturday morning at 8.15 in YouTube in our personal website. So you can reach us there. But we also have the video on demand afterwards. There, there may be some, some days there's a gap between the original live transmission and the edited version, which is pretty much just the intro and the outro. Uh, but whether you're watching the live transmission or the further on-demand video, leave your comments, questions, and whatever it is. And, and we like to be in contact with you. And we, we want to start spreading the word about Teacher Learning Cast. Please, please like the page, like the YouTube page, share it, and uh, we'll meet you next week, my name. Absolutely. Thanks, Petey, and thanks, everyone. And we'll see everyone in the next broadcast. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you soon. Keep on learning.